Paul Bunyan by Eric Blair Paul Bunyan was a big boy. When he was born, it took six giant storks to deliver him. His first baby carriage was a lumber wagon pulled by oxen. He ate 40 bowls of oatmeal for breakfast. Soon, Paul grew so large that his mom had to sew his pants from blankets. His shirts were made from tents. Before long, Paul grew taller than the trees. He was stronger than any man alive. Paul was too big to sleep in the house. Instead, he slept in the barn. Paul and his parents lived in the great north woods. Sometimes, the weather was so cold that the snow and ice turned blue. One day, Paul saw a pair of blue eyes in a large snowdrift. When Paul dug into the snow, he found a blue baby ox. The ox was frozen solid. Paul blew on the baby ox. His giant breath brought the ox back to life. Babe, the blue ox, became Paul's best friend. Babe grew to be as big as Paul. Since Paul lived in the great north woods, he decided to become a lumberjack. Paul became the best lumberjack in the world. He could cut down ten trees with just one swing of his huge axe. Paul and Babe joined a logging team. They taught the loggers to make giant pancakes. They used shovels to turn the pancakes. But Paul and Babe missed traveling. After a while, Paul and Babe left the loggers. The two friends started a new trip to the west. When it rained, the tracks made by Paul's and Babe's feet filled with water. The tracks became the Great Lakes. Along the way, Paul and Babe cleared so much forest that the west became treeless. People called this land the Great Plains. Paul and Babe missed all the trees. They decided to return to the Great North Woods, and that's where they still live today. The End. John Henry versus the Mighty Steam Drill by Carrie Meister. John Henry, was he real? Back in the days before cars and jet airplanes, there was the railroad. It took thousands of strong men to build the railroad across the United States. But one still driving man stands above the rest, John Henry. People disagree about whether or not the John Henry of legend was real. We do know that building railroads was difficult, rhythmic work. Because of this, the men often sang. Songs helped the men keep the pace of their work. The legendary John Henry was the subject of many of the songs. Eventually, steam drills were introduced to the railroad companies. The men who had built the steam drills thought the machines could work faster than any man. On at least one occasion, sometime in the 1870s, they decided to see if the steam drill was better than a man. Who was tested against the machine? Legend states that it was John Henry. The night John Henry was born, the skies turned black and rumbled. In fact, the very moment John Henry took his first breath, a bolt of lightning struck a giant sycamore tree. Oh, Lordy, was John Henry a mighty fine babe. His legs were the size of tree trunks, and his arms, they were as long as the kitchen table. But most surprising of all was that he clutched in his newborn baby hand a ten-pound steel-driving hammer. Yes, sirree, John Henry used that hammer. Bang! He built a fort when he was just three years old. Clang! At the age of six, John Henry built a road. Clink! By the time he was nine years old, he carved a statue from a mountain. John was always singing while he, he was hammering away. 
I was born with a hammer in my hand. Oh, yeah, I was born with a hammer in my hand. Got me a hammer in my hand. Yes, sir. Got me a fine hammer in my hand. When John Henry turned 14, he said to his daddy, I heard they are needing some good strong men to work on the railroad. I reckon they could use my help. Yes, sir. I reckon they could use my help. So his mama cooked up a fine farewell feast. When he was as stuffed as a turkey on Thanksgiving Day, John Henry set off to find the railroad camp. Well, John hadn't gotten too far when he heard all kinds of screaming and shouting. A hospital was burning down and people were trapped inside. Faster than a jackrabbit, John Henry used his hammer to pound through the walls. He carried out every man, woman, and child. As John Henry continued on his way, he felt obliged to help others. Bing! He built 243 homes for the poor. Bang! He saved people from a terrible rock slide. Cling! He built a bridge across the Allegheny River. All the while, John was singing away. I was born with a hammer in my hand. Oh yeah, I was born with a hammer in my hand. Got me a hammer in my hand. Yes, sir. Got me a fine hammer in my hand. Finally, John Henry saw it, the C&O Railroad Work Camp. He heard banging and clanging and workers singing. His skin started to prickle, for he knew this was the life for him. He rushed over to the captain. My name's John Henry, sir, and I'm a steel driving man, he said. No hammer on this good old earth rings like mine. No, sir, no hammer rings quite like mine. Captain Tommy smiled and said, Use that hammer of yours, my son. Drive those stakes into rock. John Henry drove those steel stakes into the mountain day after day, year after year. He did more work in one day than other men did in a week. He worked so fast that his hammer caught fire several times a day. Of course, he was always smiling and singing, too. My name is John Henry, and I'm a steel driving man. Got me a hammer in my hand, oh yeah, got me a fine hammer in my hand. One day, a man from the CNO approached Captain Tommy. This here steam drill can drive holes into rock quick as lightning, he said. This machine will do the work of 100 men. The workers looked mighty worried. Where would they find work if the machine took away their jobs? The men looked at John Henry, and John Henry knew just what to do. Now don't you worry, friends, John said. Don't you worry a bit. Before that steam drill will beat me down, I'll die with a hammer in my hand. Oh yeah, I'll die with a hammer in my hand. John turned to the man and said, I've got a deal for you. Yes, sir. I've got a deal for you. That man listened to John's proposition, and this is how it went. If John Henry could clear more rock than that steam drill in one day, then the man and his machine would turn tail and head home. The next morning, John was polishing his 20-pound hammer. The railroad man oiled his machine. The crowd gathered. And when that starting shot fired, John Henry jumped to the top of the mountain. The railroad man started the steam drill. All day, John Henry kept hammering away and filling his holes with dynamite. Bing! Bang! Clang! The steam drill was working away, too. Whiss! Hiss! Clink! But no one could tell who was winning. As the sun set, the finishing shot rang out. John came down from the top of that mountain. The railroad man stopped the hissing machine. The captain got out his tape measure. John Henry sunk a 14-foot hole, he yelled. And the steam drill is only 
nine feet deep. The workers cheered, but John Henry was worn out. He fell down, clutching his hammer to his chest. Captain Tommy held John Henry's head and looked into his eyes. That was a mighty fine job you did, John Henry. I've beat him, Captain Tommy. I've beat him to the bottom, but I'm dead. John Henry kissed his hammer, groaned, and closed his eyes. Some folks say John Henry is buried in the sand, not too far from that tunnel. And any time a train rumbles by the spot, Passengers salute that still driving man, yes, sir. They praise John Henry, the still driving man. The legend of John Henry spread across the United States over time through songs. As workers traveled across the country, their songs changed. The songs took on new flavors, the flavors of the people singing them. Some people added that John Henry had a wife. Some people added that he had a baby. When people sang about John Henry's death, some claimed he had a heart attack. Others said that a blood vessel had broken in his head. There are many versions of the John Henry legend, both in song and story. John Henry's can-do attitude has been championed for more than a hundred years. First railroad workers sang the song, then musicians, playwrights, and storytellers began telling it. John Henry's legend lives on today because it is a tale of hard work and perseverance. John Henry's legend proves that one person can make a difference in the lives of many. Pecos Bill by Stephen Kellogg Back in the rugged pioneer days when Pecos Bill was a baby, his kinfolk decided that New England was becoming entirely too crowded, so they piled into covered wagons and headed west. The clan considered settling in East Texas until Bill's ma noticed a homesteader putting up a shack about 50 miles away. Another crowded neighborhood, she grumbled. Let's push on. As they crossed the Pecos River, Bill threw out a fishing line. But when a Texas trout nibbled, Bill was yanked overboard. He was towed far downstream, and he would have drowned for sure if an old coyote hadn't grabbed him. Her family adopted Bill and taught the ways of wild creatures. By the time Bill had outgrown his breeches, he felt like a member of the pack. He loved to romp with his coyote brothers, and as he grew older, he sometimes played with the bighorn sheep. One day, a drifter named Chuck stumbled across Bill while he was taking a nap. He asked Bill what he meant by snoozing in the brush without his trousers. Bill tried to explain that he was a coyote. Horse feathers, said Chuck. You're a Texan, just like me. Bill decided to give life as a Texan a try. He borrowed Chuck's extra clothes and peppered him with questions. To tell you the truth, said Chuck, most Texans are flea-bitten outlaws, and the worst of them are the Hell's Gulch gang. But even they would be okay if they'd become ranchers and herd the longhorns that wander hereabouts. Ranching sounded good to Bill, and he headed for Hell's Gulch, determined to recruit the gang. But Bill's plans were interrupted when he was ambushed by a giant rattlesnake. When Bill dodged the snake's fangs, it slapped its coils around him. The snake squeezed hard, but Bill squeezed harder, and he didn't let up until every drop of poison was out of that reptile, leaving it skinny as a rope and mild as a goldfish. Then, before Bill could catch his breath, he was tackled by a critter that was part grizzly, part puma, part gorilla, and part tarantula. They wrestled up and down the canyon and kicked up quite a dust storm before the monster was finally became so dizzy it had to quit. No one had ever tangled with those two varmints and lived to tell the tale.
So when Bill met up with the Hell's Gulch gang, they were thunderstruck. Who's the boss of this outfit? Bill asked. I was, mumbled Gunsmith, but now you are. Bill told the gang that he was going to turn every last one of them into respectable ranch hands, but the men claimed that Texas cattle were much too ornery to ever put up with ranching. Bill had a sudden inspiration, and he approached a longhorn that was sulking nearby. Just as the bull whirled around to trample him, Bill snagged him with the rattlesnake and yanked with all his might. Cattle roping has just been invented. Bill scared that bull out of its skin with a blood-curdling coyote howl. The embarrassed creature high-tailed it off to grow a new coat, while Bill cut the hide into strips and passed them out to the men to use as lassos. Then cowboys and cattle tangled in a rough and tumble hullabaloo that is remembered to this day as the first Western Rodeo. When it ended, the gang declared they would be cowboys forever, and they promised to help Bill round up every steer in Texas. Bill needed a horse to ride on the big roundup. Well, said Chuck, there's a wild stallion in the mountains that some folks call lightning. Others think the name Windowmaker suits him better, but no matter what you call him, he's the fastest, most beautiful horse in the world. Bill went off in search of lightning. As soon as he saw him, Bill knew he'd found the horse for him. Bill chased lightning north to the Arctic Circle and south to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Finally, he cornered the stallion and jumped onto his back. Lightning exploded from the canyon, leaping and bucking across three states. Then Bill began to sing in the language he had learned from his coyote family. He sang of his admiration for the stallion's strength and promised him a lifetime of partnership and devotion. When Bill was done singing, he offered the horse his freedom, but Lightning chose to follow him forever. With Pecos Bill and Lightning leading them, the cowboys whooped across the state of Texas, rounding up every last steer but their high spirits collapsed when they were faced with the job of driving that enormous herd back and forth between the summer and winter ranges. To silence their grumbling, Bill set up the perpetual motion, motion ranch on Pinnacle Peak, which was so high that the top remained in winter while spring and autumn turned into summer at the base. A team of prairie dogs helped Bill to fence off the mountain so that the cattle could wander through the seasons unattended. Bill's plan worked fine except that Pinnacle Peak was so steep the steers fell right off whenever there was a breeze. The men had to work harder than ever carrying the cattle back up the hill. Bill solved that problem by inventing steers with very short legs on one side of their bodies. Even in a windstorm, these cattle could stand securely on the slope as long as they kept their short-legged size uphill. Now the men at Perpetual Motion Ranch had all kinds of free time, and Bill became known as the world's greatest cowboy. But the high point of Bill's life came when Slewfoot Sue passed by on the back of a catfish. Bill was instantly in love and he hollered a proposal of marriage. Sue agreed on two conditions. First, Bill had to buy her a wedding dress with a bustle, and second, he had to let her ride lightning to the ceremony. The first request was easy. Bill galloped to Dallas and brought back the fanciest bustle dress in the city. Sue's second request was not so simple. Although Slewfoot Sue was a first-rate rider, the moment her bustle touched the saddle, she was blasted skyward. Sue soared around the moon and began the long descent to Earth. She landed squarely on her bustle, but quick as Bill was, he couldn't get to her before she bounced back into outer space. Time and time again, Sue hit the ground and rocketed back toward the stars. Sue probably would have sailed back and forth forever if Bill hadn't lassoed a tornado to help him catch his bouncing bride. 
The pair of them clung to that careening storm until it blew itself out over California. To Bill's amazement, he and Sue landed on top of his ma and pa's wagon. Bill couldn't believe his kinfolk were still searching for a home site. He told them they could spend the rest of their days roaming, but they'd never find a place to equal Texas. Everyone returned to Bill's ranch for a wingding of a family reunion, and today their descendants are still there, happily herding cattle. Thank you for joining me for Tall Tales.